Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now today, I'm actually volunteering at the Saskatoon Museum of Military Artifacts, where we've got some school groups in. I'm covering mainly the, the First World War, so excuse the way I'm dressed. But while we're here in the museum, we thought we'd use our D-Day model as a bit of a backdrop, because we're going to do a film about the D-Day landings, but not specifically about the landings, about lots of things around it, the subterfuge, the preparation, because we're going to lead to a, the last part of the story, which concerns a certain head teacher and his daily telegraph crosswords. So, D-Day, 6th of June, 1944, the Allied landing on the coast of Normandy. 156,000 troops were landed. It's quite something, but there are so many code names. Overlord, that's D-Day. But there's also Neptune, which is the landing of the troops from the sea onto the beaches. There is Utah Beach, Omaha Beach. Those are the American beaches. Then you've got the code names for the British, Gold and Sword. And then you have Juno for the Canadians. There is so much involved around the actual landings. And this is what's gonna lead me to the little finale of our films. But while I was doing the research, I became captivated what was going on in England with regards to preparations for the D-Day landings, Overlord. What people don't realize is all the preparation and planning that went on prior to D-Day. Operation Fortitude, I've been reading about it. It's the intelligence operation. Now, people will be familiar because of recent films uh, and also the old film, The Man That Never Was. Operation Mincemeat, where they actually floated the body of a, of a vagrant, uh, bless him, who died of pneumonia, with false documents, throwing the Germans off the scent that there was going to be an Allied landing on Sicily. So even before D-Day, we are already deceiving the Germans. And of course, don't forget, we could intercept their messages because we had captured one of their Enigma machines and the code had been cracked. Bletchley Park, how busy those people were. And then, then Fortitude itself, the overall intelligence deception. Garbo, the uh, Spanish agent, but he was a double agent, so he's feeding German some information, but then relaying back to the British the correct information. Believe it or not, he was awarded the Iron Cross, and it may have been the MBE, I think the British awarded to him after D-Day. This is so incredible because the Germans believed D-Day was going to happen by us attacking Calais, or was it Norway? We kept them guessing, to the extent where we had a phantom army in the south of England under General Patton. Transport moving around and then messages, all the signals, the telephones, everything going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, just like you would expect an army to do. We also had a phantom army in the north of England as well. So an invasion of Norway, quite possible. The inflatable tanks, the inflatable aircraft. So any spotter aircraft that came over by the Germans could see this phantom army, which simply did not exist. We had got to keep the Germans guessing. The last thing we wanted them to know was what location was the D-Day landings. And on top of that, I have the most fascinating piece that I just can't get my head around. If you've got 156,000 troops landing and you've got them thousands of tanks and thousands of trucks and jeeps and goodness knows what, how are you going to give them petrol? How are you going to feed them the gas they need? Your average tank, give it a mile, that's a gallon of gas. So how are they going to feed all of those tanks, all of those jeeps and trucks? Because we've got to feed not just the British and Canadian, but all of the Americans as well. So let's invent another code word, Pluto. Pipeline under the ocean. The British are going to actually unwind a, a pipeline from England, from the south coast, all the way across to Normandy. It's going to come out in a, a village not far from Bayer. So that area has got to be captured quickly. This will actually come online, Pluto, 
in August 1944. When you think about it, hang on a second, so 1944, we're going to make enough pipeline that's going to stretch the 20 odd miles across the channel. It's going to lie on the seabed, they're going to do two. One which is of a reinforced pipe, the other one a cheaper one. So they guess that if one fails, the other one will, will be able to do the gas. The only problem is, when you actually get that working, how does the gas, the petrol, go to the troops? Jerry cans. Cans of petrol will be filled up from Pluto. This just goes on and on. You've got your airborne landings, you've got your glider landings, you've got your commandos coming in, you've got your navy. And I was just reading about fire orders, which to, to the military man, you understand straight away. Your fire orders, so you're on board a ship, you have your orders, you have your range, you have your target, you open fire. You imagine the tonnage in shells, ammunition, just for the ships. And then you have a coordinated approach of tanks on landing craft, opening fire before they hit the beach. At one stage, you have landing craft going in front of the foot soldiers who are gonna hit the beach, firing their rockets, firing their artillery pieces, and just before they get too shallow, they peel around and come back, and then the infantry can go forward. The Allied air attack alone, the bombing, it's just mind-blowing. So you imagine you've got all of this going on. You've got Pluto, it's in the preparation. You've got fortitude, you've got false armies. Meanwhile, you've got to get your real armies down onto the south coast. You have got to practice landing on beaches. Now you can't do this in full view of the Germans because they will know what's going on, they will follow you. Mistakes were made. Uh, Exercise Tiger at Slapton Sands in, uh, in Devon. Entire area of, of southwest of England had been, the population had been moved out. The Americans were using it as a training ground for their attack on Utah Beach. But unfortunately, 946 GIs would lose their lives when they went out to sea in their landing craft. Their escorts were either too slow or there was a problem and these landing craft were intercepted by German torpedo boats, the E-boats. Very, very sad. But then you look at how are they going to get the supplies ashore in Normandy. There were mines, there were obstacles, there was problems. And this was put to the general staff. What if we can't capture a port in time? And Winston Churchill says, well, build one. How? Don't give me problems, give me solutions. Winston Churchill at his finest. The Mulberry Harbour. They built two massive Mulberry Harbours. These are floating pontoons weighed down with concrete that you could get large ships out at sea to actually tie up against, offload, and this stuff comes onto the beach. It's incredible the sheer amount of manpower that went into the building of these Mulberry Harbours. So you imagine in the south of England, just a month or so before the D-Day landings, they must have been so incredibly busy, Operation Fortitude in the background, the phantom armies, the real armies, everybody's building up momentum, ships coming into Southampton, everything is about to take off, when something could have stopped the whole lot. An incredible breach of security. The code words are out. On the 2nd of May, 1944, the Daily Telegraph with their crossword, one of the clues, Utah. Then on the 22nd of May, it's Omaha. 27th of May, Overlord. And then the 30th of May, Mulberry. So you imagine the tensions in the intelligence service of the British and the Americans, how they are building. And it's just about a week before D-Day itself. 1st of June, when the, <laughs> the Telegraph crossword gives the great code word, Neptune. So now we have five out of ten of the main code words for D-Day have been placed in the crossword. Is it a German spy? A double agent? Who is it? So MI5 leap into action and they catch their spy. Leonard Dorr, the headmaster from Strand School, and the story of what he was doing is absolutely brilliant. So Leonard Dawes has been arrested. He is suspected of being 
an enemy agent. His senior colleague, Melville Jones, is also arrested and these men are put through the mill. And the story that comes out is, is quite interesting because the entire school had been evacuated out of the London area to Effingham in Surrey. And what Leonard used to do was leave a crossword grid, an empty one, for the pupils to actually write in words. And then Leonard would actually put the clue to the words. It would appear this is coincidence, or was it? Because this whole thing, five out of 10 of the main code words, it's a little bit suspicious. But the truth, the absolute truth of this wouldn't come out until the 40th anniversary of the D-Day landings. It was Ronald French who was 14 at the time of the landings and was part of the school. And he filled in the details. The boys got their ideas for the clues from American soldiers who were stationed in a base next to the school. The boys were hunting for unusual words. So Utah, Omaha, words that were being bandied around by the American soldiers. Interesting, isn't it, that they overheard it. Careless talk costs lives. At the end of the day, this whole business of the crossword was pure coincidence. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little video there covering a bit of D-Day and that incredible story of the crossword puzzle. So many stories in history, and as you know, I love to give them. So thanks for watching, like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the all notification buttons because I do understand that it does sometimes work. Not every time, but sometimes. But before I go, special shout out to a couple of my Patreon members, Brett Bottomley and Campfire Bandit, aka Brian. Hey guys, thanks a million.